Um, the first would be on the, you know, what one could term the civilian mullah nexus, right, which is the growing interface between civilians and militants. Um, I, I alluded to this, and, and I, I know the, the general that you, that you were referencing, um, and I think, I think that's a very important point, and I think it's one that, um, you know, we can explore a little bit further, uh, particularly to say, um, while I endorse that vantage point, I would suggest that to a degree, one of the, the driving factors for civilians um, working with these, some of these militant outfits stems from the fact that they were patronized by the Army and the ISI, which contrib contributed to their power. I think that is yet another, um, you know, now barrier to checking their growth but I don't think it's the civilians that are standing in the way of dismantling. I think what the civilians are doing is you see an emerging civilian mullah nexus because of the military mullah nexus that had been extant for some time. And that there is, um, now what happens is as they quote piggyback on that, um, you know, what they do is you do on a uh, case by case basis contribute to their strength. Um, so as I said, these sort of, you know, some of the endorsements for SSP owes to the fact that they control vote banks, the same with Jamaat Adawa. Um, and I think it bodes ill for action under a, even a civilian regime, because so long as the military is allowing, and let's be honest, it's only the military in concert with the police that could take these actors apart, right? The police right now are completely incapable. Um, until the military and the police work together, and that starts with the military ceasing its support for all these actors, what civilians will continue to do is continue to, to, to take advantage of various militant groups' existence where they can, and in doing so, will contribute to their growing power, making it all the more difficult to take action down the road. So I think it is that cyclical type of element. Um, so I would make that point there. Uh, in terms of the, um, you know, continued support for these groups and, and your, your, your question about what that looks like in terms of continuing to patronize the India-centric actors, yes. I mean, that is absolutely continuing to happen and the degree to which it is happening in some degrees so overtly is, is disturbing. Um, you know, as late as 2010, I still hear reports of Lashkar camps in areas under government control, right? It's one thing for some camps in the tribal areas not to be touched. It's quite another thing when you have a Lashkar camp in Monsera, which for those, you know, who may not be familiar with the geography, is in the north of, of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, formerly NWFP, right on the border with Pakistan-administered Kashmir, along the Hazara belt, not close to what is happening in the tribal areas. I mean, this is not an area that is infested with militants and the army can't get in there. This is very clearly an area where it's under government control and they're allowed to have their camp. And that's it. Um, so long as we have patronage of that sort, um, you know, I mean, I think we are so far from the security establishment making the decision that, that they have to move against them. And I, I, I wrote this line in my book, and I think it applies particularly for the India-centric groups, but also for the Haqqanis. Um, you know, an ISI officer asked me, who benefits if we go after these, these guys? And who pays? And his rhetorical answer was the benefit, particularly for LET, is India. That's who benefits. And the Haqqanis, it's America. And who pays? It's us. So they're going to continue to, you know, to support these actors, I think, for the foreseeable future, because they're going to remain India-centric for the foreseeable future um, until they completely exhaust themselves and realize that they're not going to get anywhere with it. And then they're going to have to deal with all these other domestic issues and, and all these other problems that they've created. So those are, I mean, to, to, to some of, I think, some of the key points that, that you flagged, I think. And then finally, in terms of... Um, civilian weakness going forward. Uh, you know, 
Uh, for those who encourage engaging with civilians in, in Pakistan, and I am one who has said that the U.S. needs to do a much better job of engaging the civilian government, and I don't just mean giving money, okay? I mean that it's ridiculous when we have a congressman go to Pakistan and demand to meet with Kayani. No, you meet with people in the National Assembly. That's who you meet with, okay? You're a bloody congressman. It's not like congressmen come here and meet with the, the chief of army staff, right? Um, so until we get much better at, and we are, we're working on it. We're working hard on getting better at our civilian engagement. Um, that only goes so far, right? Because fine, uh, you know, it's very easy to talk about civilian engagement now, or it's not so easy, but we're talking about civilian engagement now with, let's be honest, and I'll speak bluntly, um, a feckless civilian government in Islamabad, but at least one that is not friendly to militancy. I don't think the Sharif brothers have any love for the army, um, but they've certainly got a soft corner for some of you know the militant groups. It's you know it's there's no contradiction for you were talking about the middle class. It's no contradiction for a middle class Punjabi businessman to have his hand out to India with what you know one hand wanting to to make money off of trade with India and reaching in with the other hand to give money to the SSP or Jamaat Dawa. So that's going to make for a complex interaction if the PMLN comes into office for the U.S. and we're going to have to figure out how to work with them. And if Imran Khan comes in, well, you know, we all perceive him to be the Army's man. Um, and he's made statements like we should cease fighting against militants tomorrow, the Taliban are, are our brothers. That's going to be very complicated as well. In some regards, I would suggest that could be better because then at least everybody's cards are out on the table. But I'll, I'll conclude with this. I, I am critical of Pakistan, but I, also, I try to be objectively critical, um, and I try never to be pejorative. Um, and so while I've upset different actors at different times, I have to say I respect the fact that I'm continually welcomed back into Pakistan and that I'm allowed, my views are solicited by, by various interlocutors. The problem is it's very difficult to have a frank discussion when Pakistanis don't admit admit on the record that there are terrorist training camps in their country or that there's any support for these actors. And there, that vociferous denial of Panetta's statement is to me part of the problem. You cannot, if we can't have any type of exchange, then we can't move, then we cannot get to changing the cost benefit analysis. Um, let me stop there. Just I wanted to touch on a couple of your points and yeah. Yeah, uh, well, yeah please introduce yourself. Hi. Um, hi, Dr. Tenkel and uh, Mr. Ba Balachandran. I'm Pushpa Vijula. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Dr. Tenkel. Uh, have, you, um, have you read Apology of an Inside Economic Hitman? Apology of an Inside... Yes. Okay. Now, once you've read the book, we do... and. Firstly, I want to point out to both of you that Indians and Indians and Pakistanis, there have been umpteen friendly visits between India and Pakistan, and civilians have no problem. It's the politicians who have the problem and continue to have the problem and cannot settle matters. Putting that on the record, it also stands to America's benefit that they've spawned, uh, India has been screaming I don't know how many times that please don't fund Pakistan and they have given you proof of terrorist camps and America refuses to acknowledge it until it becomes a severe problem. And I, my statement is that it stands to America's benefit to feed and continue feeding this problem because you ultimately want to make a military base in India. So to, have a, to make your inroads here, no, this is a fact. <clears throat> it is to your benefit to allow this situation to continue. Please comment. Um, I disagree. <laughs> you, I, I, can, I, can extra, I can expand on that. Um, our military, to, look, uh, first of all, our two countries have grown much closer over the last several years. And one area where the US and India are actually doing quite well is on military to military cooperation. To my knowledge, we do more joint exercises with India, and India does more joint exercises with the US than any other countries. Um, you asked me to respond, so hold, hold the mic for a second. I'll respond fully, okay? 
Um, this idea that we are funneling money into Pakistan and contributing to the problem, yeah, um, we've, we've given a lot of money to the military um, and it hasn't bought us a whole lot. Now, you can argue that the consequences are not what we would have liked and have been detrimental in some regards, um, but I think that the impetus that you ascribe to, to giving that money is completely incorrect. Um, we gave that money because our primary objective was to capture and or kill Al-Qaeda, and we saw funding the Pakistani military and the ISI as the best way of capturing or killing the people who attacked U.S. on 9-11. Now, you can argue that that was the wrong reaction, but that was the reason for the reaction, okay? And one of the reasons we continue to give money is because until recently, the ALOCs and GLOCs, the air logistical, the lines of, of support um, into Afghanistan in terms of airline, airspace, and in terms of ground, ground lines, ran through Pakistan. And so we were buying the ability to ship our goods, okay? Yeah. The 9-11 was to the great benefit of America and there is a very, very strong proposition that this was completely engineered by the White House. That, putting, putting it for the record, now you also stated that you disagree that this is to your benefit, to America's benefit to continue this problem. I wish to put it uh, that this is on film and in two years, if this happens, I want you to give me an honorary, uh, I don't know what, citation or whatever that I, you said no, and this is what I stated over here. If, if you, you see that what I said is going to happen. Okay. I love you a good conspiracy theory with, uh, as much Mr. as the Shizira. next guy, but I think probably we have other yeah, questions. You can discuss this offline with her. Hmm? Uh, hello. I'm Dinesh hello. Rana. And I want to know the mystery behind the CIA agent some years back caught by the uh, America who was, uh, who was involved in the Mumbai attack and in collaboration with the laskar e taiba chief. I which, forgot his name. Which CIA agent? David Hadley. David, 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 David Hadley. Right. David Hadley, he was a, yeah. who was a confirmed uh, yeah. CIA agent. Uh, and he, actually, was, he was in the touch with the laskar e taiba and he was involved in the Mumbai attack. And he was not given up, uh, given to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Indian agency to for a, you know uh, uh, other you know uh, uh, questioning. Okay. Um, did you uh, wanna... May I answer that? I know something about it, not official, of course. Headley was never a CIA agent. He was a DIA agent, DIA. and that too. You see, these uh, we think that if a person is working for one agency. The other agency also knows about him. It doesn't happen anywhere. In no country it happens, even, not even in India. For example, if there is a source for my old organization, which is raw, the IB will not know. The state police will not know. So, Hadley did work for U.S. government, that is for the drug uh, enforcement agency. But that doesn't mean that the CIA or FBI or other agency will know about him. So I personally think that today's discussion is better not to go into Headley because we can discuss it for one day, whole day. There is a lot of uh, mystery about it. The mystery is mainly because of his plea bargain in Chicago court that he will not be extradited to Denmark or India. So we, if we are going to believe that Hadley will be brought to trial in India, it is a pipe dream, let me tell you that. And if government uh, functionaries from Delhi are assuring the Indian media that Hadley will be brought to trial, that also is misplaced. Uh, uh, my name is Samrat, I'm a journalist. Yes. Um, you know, I will address this to whoever wants to take the question. Don't you see a danger of meltdown after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? What? Don't you see a situation of possible return to civil war after the U.S. In, withdrawal? In Afghanistan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of our main con we have, from a U.S. perspective, I think there are two primary concerns about Afghanistan following withdrawal. One is that Al Qaeda or other um, militant groups with 
transnational reach are able to um, re-secure territory there and use it as a base for support. The second is that the country could descend into civil war. Um, now, what is the U.S. doing about that? Um, several things, and it remains to be seen, quite frankly, whether they are sufficient. Um, one is there is discussion to leave a residual force uh, whose size is yet to be determined, although I would probably estimate it's going to be around 20,000 soldiers, um, in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. That's part of what the, um, the agreement that was signed between Obama and Karzai states. Um, there will be you know, temporary basing rights there. Um, it will be leased so that those actors can continue to support the Afghan security forces, the Afghan National Army, um, you know, in their operations as well as to, um, you know, for lack of a better term, hunt those actors who may pose a transnational threat. Um, in addition to that, you know, one of the, the main lessons I think that at least from a U.S. perspective policymakers have taken from history is that if one looks at the, you know, pull out of the Soviets in 1989, the Najibullah regime and the army remained intact until the funding stopped in 1992. So one of the key issues now is finding, you know, enough money to continue to keep the ANA, um, you know, intact and funded. Uh, in addition to that, I would also argue that one of the other important components is going to be there's going to be, you know, a huge vacuum in terms of, of money as all the different uh, you know, NGOs and, and other foreigners leave the country. And so finding a way to keep the economy, uh, you know, afloat in Afghanistan is going to be important as well. Now, that said, the composition of the Afghan, Afghan National Army, in particular, the poor representation of Pashtuns, particularly at the officer level, uh, you know, that is, there are significant concerns about what could happen, uh, fueled by the fact that everybody seems to be positioning themselves to support somebody in the event that civil war breaks out. I would include the U.S., you know, vis-a-vis -vis continuing to back the Karzai regime, and India, um, you, know, you know, revisiting its uh, connections with the previous Northern Alliance, some of whom are now in the army. Um, and the Pakistanis, of course, continuing to support the Quetta Shura and the Haqqani network. Um, and the Iranians are there as well. And so there's, yes, there is real concern about what the situation in Afghanistan will look like. Um, and it, right now, could I sit here and give assurances that there will not be a descent into chaos as Ahmed Rashid terms it? No, I couldn't. Um, I have two questions and it'd be good to get both of your responses. Um, the first is, um, do you attach any importance to um, assessing the dominant rhetoric of these groups and has it changed over the last few years? Um, and the second is in terms of the, uh, you, you mentioned that the civilian militant nexus is increasing. Uh, what has changed to address the genuine civilian concern that cooperation cannot be easily bought, and uh, particularly in terms of uh, civilian lives with drones? So, those two. Um, I, your, on your second question, that civilian cooperation cannot be? Easily bought. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so on your first question with, regarding the rhetoric, it's a very good one. Um, and, you know, my sense is with some of these groups, the rhetoric has not changed in 20 years. lashkar e Taibo was talking about the Hindu Zionist Crusader Alliance back in the early 1990s. It wasn't until 2611 that it acted on it and, you know, targeted all three in one fell swoop, um, Hindus being the, you know, over, and Indians being the overwhelming majority of that. That said, do we put stock, do I put stock when there are specific um, shifts? Yes, I think shifts are important. Uh, so for example, before the TTP sent Faisal Shahzad to the U.S., it began talking about sending people to the U.S. And so that was an important shift. When the TTP talked about wanting to take revenge for Osama bin Laden, I think people took notice of that. Um, Although, from an analytical perspective, my sense is that we need to look at what these actors say, what they do, and what others say about them. Um, because rhetoric on its own, I think, is not enough to understand really what their objectives are at the ground reality and what their capabilities are, right? I mean, you can talk about 
wanting to set the White House on fire, but if you know, you're a three-person you know, network, then you're probably not gonna do it. Um, now, as to your question about the civilians, I, you know, I actually think the civilians, let me say this as diplomatically as possible, um, I think that the civilians are far more amenable to policy shifts in response to aid flows than is the military. Um, I don't think the problem is that the civilian government or even the, the, the PMLN um, wouldn't go, wouldn't seek to dismantle these groups if the reward in terms of aid flows and economic assistance were great enough. In fact, I would argue probably that, that certainly the PPP and even the PMLN would, would be willing to, to, to take those steps. It's that while the military and the ISI are continuing to protect some of these groups, why not then get the benefit from it? And it doesn't help that some of the constituents, I mean, historically, um, you know, as people rise into the middle class, in, it's, it's often actually the middle classes that are more pro, you know, some of these militant organizations than it is the impoverished. Um, that's, that's not the case just in Pakistan, that's been the case in other areas as well. As people become more educated and more aware, um, they, are, they are drawn to these groups and research has borne that out, that it's not, the, the poverty link is not really there. Now in terms of the drones, is that an impediment? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I mean I think we all, I, I think, yeah, you know, I think the drone set, um, let me put my cards on the table for where I come from. As an American, do I think that the U.S. should make a wholesale, uh, you know, commitment to ceasing the drones? No, and I probably, that's probably going to be an unpopular position in this room. But if, it had, if the U.S. had Ayman al zawahri in its sights, do I think that, that they should use, you know, and the dro a drone strike was the best way of killing him? Do I think that they should use a drone to do that? Yeah. Do I think that killing uh, Abu Yahya al-Libi last week in a drone strike, um, you know, was a net positive? Overall, you know, if your aim is to completely, you know, uh, d d disable and destroy that network, fine. But I think that they should be, and I've written this and I've said this publicly, used very, very surgically for only high value targets, right? Um, now, surgically is, a, is an unfortunate term. Um, so let me say, I think they should be used only for high value targets. Um, I do not think that the U.S. should be engaging in signature strikes, which but for people who don't know a signature strike is where you get a bunch of armed men together in a room because, you know, that never happens in FATA, you know. Um, so I don't think that they should be engaging in, in signature strikes. I don't think they should be used for mid-level militants. Um, I think they should be used only for very high value targets. Um, that's an imperfect answer. I say that as an American who wishes to see these people killed and doesn't and don't don't think that the Pakistanis are going to be able to do it themselves. Um, do I recognize that the U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis drones up until this point has been very problematic? Yeah, it's set, I think, a dangerous precedent. Um, I think the use of that technology as it spreads will have ramifications that we don't yet fully understand. Um, and I would argue that it would be better if the military were launching drone strikes as opposed to the CIA because then they would have to accord by the Geneva Convention and there would be far more transparency. So I see a lot of problems with the process, but could I sit here and honestly tell you my opinion is they should be completely taken off the table? No, I can't. And I would add that they kill a whole lot less people than do Pakistani airstrikes. Now, I would also like to see some type of cooperation between the Pakistanis and the U.S. on drones as there was in the past. The problem is, whereas the U.S. has suggested a willingness to cooperate and even made that offer again more recently, the Pakistanis are demanding that drone technology. And I'm pretty sure most people in this room don't want us to give it to them. There's, there hasn't been a single drone uh, attack so far which hasn't killed civilians. So I'm asking in terms of um, you know, the data on this is very obscure. 
I would refer you to the New America Foundation, which has done the best study, and the, you know, an aggregate. Um, you know, look, John Brennan, uh, you know, the CIA counter. I'm not sorry, the U.S. counterterrorism advisor for Obama has said there's zero civilian casualties. That's not true. Okay, there have been other reports that it's like 80% civilian casualties. Most um, reporting, as good as it is, has shown that's not true. Generally, there's about you know, the, the, the New America Foundation, and this is their data, not mine, I think has come out with something like 30 or percent roughly, um, which suggests that in some attacks there's probably no civilian casualties, and in others there's a lot. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer for you. Um, please know it is something that I wrestle with quite a bit. Uh, this is the election year in US and uh, what we have been seeing uh, is the general American public is frustrated about Pakistan yeah. and do you think that uh, the US policy of Pakistan and about militancy in Afghanistan having influenced by the domestic politics of US over the State Department uh, because of the presidential elections and do you think any significant change after November 2012 if Obama gets re-elected or if there is a change in guard in White House? Yes, maybe. Um, certainly the domestic politics is impacting that. I would also suggest that um, the, the uh, completely incorrect expectations of what the U.S. was going to receive in terms of cooperation. And on the Pakistani side, I think their expectations were incorrect as well. And this stems from the fact that the two countries you know, I mean, Pakistan entered into an alliance with America with a, gu with a gun to its head, all right? They were not natural allies before. They're not necessarily natural allies now. They don't share the same strategic interests in some areas, although both share an interest in not having Afghanistan implode. They just go about trying to achieve that quite differently. Um, I would suggest that domestic politics coupled with the fact that U.S. expectations were, I think, raised far too high by the rhetoric on both sides, you know. The same way that um, Indian and Pakistani uh, foreign ministers go to one another's countries, we are both brothers, it is natural for us to love one another. That's really nice, but let's be honest, you don't. Um, we spoke about this alliance as if it were, you know, we were in lockstep, and that is just not the case. Um, and so when the reality set in, you know, and came crashing down on both countries, uh, it, I think, contributed to the situation now where because of the domestic politics in both countries, exacerbated by the completely flawed um, interaction between them, has contributed to a situation where U.S. and Pakistani interlocutors are now talking past one another, okay? Even I, I'm not in the government. When I sit down and talk to my Pakistani colleagues, I mean, you know, sometimes we sit and talk for five hours because it takes the first two and a half or three before we're just not making statements at one another instead of having a discussion. So it's, you know, all of that is contributing. Now, will that change? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, after there's an election in Pakistan and after there's an election in the U.S., will that decrease some of the domestic pressure? Absolutely. Um, certainly in terms of the election in Pakistan, that could introduce a whole new set of challenges or opportunities. It remains to be seen who's, uh, who's, who's elected. Whether it's Obama or Romney, I think both are going to take a pretty realist approach to Pakistan in the U.S., and so I don't think that will have a major impact. And I think at that point, what will matter most come January uh, 2013 is how things shape up in you know, the run-up to the U.S. drawdown in 2014. That's what will make a bigger difference in terms of the relationship than necessarily the domestic politics at that point. So, a very important sector which you missed out is about transport in the region. Oh, I only missed one? <laughs> That's uh, my presentation. So there's a possibility that if there is a, a rail transport between Turkey and India, that will contribute greatly to the American uh, strength in Afghanistan region. And it may contribute to changing the, the situation there. Also, if there is a rail transport from Iran's ports to Afghanistan, which is hindered by the present conflict with 
viewers. I think that will also contribute greatly to reducing the, the strength of the conflict in the region. What would you like to say about this matter? Um, I think we're going to take one more question after this as well, right? Um, I, I would simply say, this, we'll take one more, or, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, we can take one more, maybe group them together, and we'll both, uh, we'll both offer our final impressions. Because I know that you were, I think they were going to give you the mic, and I appreciate your intervention, though. Yeah. Uh, let me thank both of you. You have made a very elegant presentation. My name is R.B. Burhuit. I'm an industrial engineer. I see it from the operations research point of view. You've got so many, so many uh, 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 players in this in which you are trying to uh, sum up. It's very difficult, in fact, in making it. The graphic representation is much better. If you put a dynamic mathematical model in this, which has uh, made you uh, go towards, uh, uh, towards India, uh, I mean, how you went from one to this, because there are so many uh, variables. Now, Afghanistan is one, then China is one, Pakistan is here, and India is there. Now, you know India very well. Uh, and you know that uh, India has got its concerns, and uh, mostly because of your funding to Pakistan, but you think that by funding to Pakistan, you will have some pro uh, solutions in Afghanistan. I mean, there are so many variables that you have to go for a certain type of a policy decision. So your question is? My question is that uh, what is that mathematical model that you would like to make? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a social scientist. I haven't done math since I was in high school. Um, Is because India was partitioned and Pakistan was created. What do you think would happen if Pakistan and India reunited? Okay, uh, that's a hypothetical. It's not going to happen, so I'm not going to touch on that. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll offer just a, a, a brief thought on, on these last two questions, and then we want to have the last word. Do so, you think that uh, China, China is a deeply military nation in Pakistan? It is. I didn't know that. Uh, so what, what America and uh, India together can do about it? Okay. Should we, should we, do you want to wrap up? I think, no, I, I think you should wrap, uh, wrap up. Uh, you see, we should confine only on the subject that he uh, was mentioning. That's about the, the militants in this particular region. No, I think if we bring in China and all that become, uh, and also those trans, uh, no, uh, it's a it's a big subject. There can be people have written a lot of papers about the Chinese influence, the fears, and other things. But that'll it'll go on till about nine o'clock. Yeah. But I think it's better that we don't discuss the China factor at all in this. Right. Because right now it's about the main subject is about Lashkari Taiba. Uh, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Tankel to sum up the discussion and conclude the. So here's, here's my um, sort of conclusion, um, and I'll make a couple of brief uh, points on, on the, those that were raised. One, uh, to your point about transit routes and trade, I think that is something that uh, the U.S. is very aware of. Obviously, um, transit route and trade is a very complicated subject in which um, various geopolitical calculations come into play. Um, our country favors some and not others. Um, your country favors some and not others. I will say this, um, to the degree to which we can encourage trade particularly between, you know, within the region, but particularly between India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, um, I think, you know, that would go a long way towards helping a normalization, and that is certainly something that, that you know, we're all in favor of. Um, you know, in terms of a mathematical model, um, I don't think there is a mathematical model, or at least I'm not the right one to come up with one. So let me, let me just say, um, one of the things that, that I think occupies a lot of strategic thinkers in the U.S. is how to balance um, concerns about a rising China with our engagement with India, with how we deal with some of the threats coming out of Pakistan, okay? Uh, our, our, our engagement with Pakistan right now is unfortunately primarily driven by the following. We want to kill Al-Qaeda. We want to get out of Afghanistan and not have the place implode. We want to dismantle the militant infrastructure over time. 
and we want to counter proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. All right? Now, our engagement with India is quite different, and there's a convergence on a lot of those issues with India. There are also, there's convergence on a lot of other actor, uh, things as well. Our relationship with India, the U.S. relationship with India, is an evolving one. Um, and it's also a very new one. So it makes sense, um, you know, that there are going to be areas of discord and that the two countries are both learning one another's strategic culture. I think one of the big shifts that I have seen in India in recent years is a move towards this more realist approach that the U.S. has taken for a long time. But as India moves towards a more realist approach, which is in line with the, the way the U.S. conducts foreign policy, the U.S. also needs to be prepared for India to act in its own interests as opposed to the U.S.'s. And I think we understand that. Um, and it's just sort of working out the areas in which we have concordance. Um, one of those areas, to sum up, I think where we have concordance is in um, you know, seeing a decrease in militancy in Pakistan. And to that end, the U.S. is encouraging greater Indian participation in Afghanistan than in the past. Um, Panetta has, I think, raised the issue of potentially having Indian trainers on the ground. Uh, India has been asked to contribute to you know, either the NATO mission or to the Kabul government directly in terms of funding. You know, there's a lot more engagement on Afghanistan than before. And since 2008, counterterrorism cooperation is improving. And if one accepts the fact that the Pakistanis are not going to take on this problem themselves internally, then that really leaves us with, as Mr. Balachandran said, working for international cooperation, one, to degrade transnational networks that are a threat to both our countries, and two, in particular, to, to provide, um, co to, to cooperate with India on its own homeland security issues, such that, you know, the utility of supporting proxies decreases because they, they, they can't make an impact here. Um, so I think those are some of the areas where we, where we are in, in concordance. So um, thank you all very much for your questions.